Okay, um, so um, I want to move fast because we've lost a lot of time. What I want to show you is how we restore marine ecosystems in a way that restores the biodiversity and the ecosystem function. And this is, you know, experimentally, these are new methods, they're not being done on a large scale. I just want to show you what we can do if we have the will to do it on a, on a large scale. So, first I want to say that there's a fundamental disconnect between restoration and conservation, unfortunately. And the reason is a solution to all marine conservation issues, whether coral reef survival or fisheries or anything else, is to set up marine protected areas. Okay, I want to see all marine areas protected, but the fact is we've lost almost everything already. We're dealing with, with you know, severely damaged ecosystems and only a few of those. And obviously those all need to be protected, but my point is, is that if you protect dead ecosystems, you're not going to restore the habitat. You're not going to, the fish aren't going to come back. You can go and shoot all the fishermen if you want, and the fish aren't going to come back if the carrying capacity of the ecosystem has disappeared. And that's what we're facing in most coral reef areas. The reef itself has disappeared. And so, you know, we, we no longer have fish, and we won't, by protecting dead reefs. Now, I've, I've been at marine protected areas all over the world, and I've never seen one that has more corals as a result of its management than if it had never been managed at all. Okay? So, I mean, someone put up something yesterday about hope spots, the so-called hope spots, are simply places where it hasn't been hot enough to have catastrophic bleaching. It has nothing to do with their management at all. The areas that are being managed, the corals are disappearing just as fast as everywhere else because the factors killing them are global warming and new diseases, and that's something local management can't do anything about. So, you know, it's not saying that we shouldn't avoid stepping on corals and all the other things, but we've got to deal with the, the factors that are really killing them. So my point is, is that if we don't restore the severely damaged habitats, which is what we have in most of the ocean now, we're not going to be able to restore the fisheries or the biodiversity or the ecosystem function, shore protection, everything else. So from my point of view, restoration of degraded habitats is our number one priority. It's too late for conservation. I mean, I'm not opposed to conservation, I'm all for it, but it's too late. Now, the difficulty is, is that the people promoting marine park areas say that they're the answer to all problems and they're sufficient by themselves. And so the result is we're getting a lot of marine protected areas that are not serving any function at all from any kind of practical point of view. And the people running them are threatened by restoration, oddly enough. They're opposed to it because they say, oh, well, if you say you can restore habitats, then you're giving people a license to destroy them which is like accusing tree planters of promoting Amazon deforestation. I mean, it makes no sense at all. But anyway, that, that's what we run into. So the result is the conservation community, because their money has gone to setting up marine protected areas, has actually opposed restoration in a lot of places, because to admit there's a need for restoration amounts to admitting that their management hasn't worked. And so they're, they're very reluctant to do that, given the large amounts of publicity and money that's been spent claiming that they do work. So, anyway, so my point of view is we need a real focus on active restoration, otherwise we're not going to get the ecosystem function or the fisheries recovery. So I want to show you a little bit about how we do that. Now, what I call first-generation artificial reefs, or enhanced habitat might be the way to put it, I don't like the term artificial reefs, were invented by people in Southeast Asia and the Pacific thousands of years ago. And what they do, I mean, I've seen it in the Philippines often, is what people will do is they will pile up rocks, stick in bamboo, they'll stick in coconut leaves, they'll stick in any garbage they have around, rubber tires, whatever, they create a physical structure in shallow water, maybe five, ten feet across, and they just leave it there for about three years. Then they come back, surround it by a net, dismantle all the rocks, and catch all the fish that have made that their habitat. And you'd be amazed in an area this big how you can get, you know, hundreds of, of groupers, for instance, if you make the right habitat. Then they rebuild the habitat and come back three years later and dismantle it. So there's this ancient tradition all through the Pacific of creating habitat in order to catch fish and snails and crabs and other things right, right in front of the villages. It's largely lost nowadays because uh, the traditional management practices have been lost pretty much everywhere except in Melanesia because when colonialism came in, they, they destroyed all the traditional management rules. Uh, suddenly the fish were available to everyone, and that had not been the case before. Only certain people had a right to fish in certain places at certain times by certain methods. And those, those traditions were deeply ingrained in Pacific societies. But anyway, they discovered how to make habitat to increase the populations of those species they wanted to eat. 
And that's an ancient, and what we call fish aggregation devices are no more than high-tech versions of what has been practiced in the Pacific for thousands of years. Okay, so that means that what we would, fishermen have known is that if they build a physical habitat, they'll create the physical structure and things will come to it. Because that's missing in most areas. We're looking at bottoms that have been, been, you know, bulldozed flat, where everything is dead. There's just no physical relief, no place to hide, and that limits the populations that can grow there. What we call second generation artificial reefs was based on an observation that Charles Darwin made in his first book in the 1830s. So he traveled around the world and he wrote his first book on coral reefs. And it's a pretty amazing book. As far as I can figure out, Darwin never actually went into the water. Okay? <laughs> but, but he read everything that had been written. He looked at every map that had made, been made by the British Admiralty. He, he made a map of coral reefs of the world that was more than 90% accurate in the 1830s, okay? and um, it's pretty amazing. And one of the things that Darwin noticed in that book is he, he took observations, there was a Jamaican paleontologist who was one of the founders of the Royal Geological Society in London who told him that in Panama, people had seen corals that had been broken off, smashed by waves, lying on the bottom, and reattaching themselves, and continuing to grow. Okay? And corals will do that if the environment's clean. They can't do it if it's covered with mud and algae and, you know, it's eutrophication. Once they put sewage in, the algae overgrow everything, and then the corals can't attach and keep growing. Okay? So in the old days, they could because the waters were clean. They can't do that anymore. But Sir Darwin was aware of that. And then he got studies from a Scottish fellow who was in Madagascar, and he was on a sandbank north of Madagascar. He found this huge coral rolling around but still alive on top of the reef flat, it had been broken off, and he drove wooden stakes around the coral to fix it in place so it wouldn't roll around. And they came back 10 or 15 years later, and he must have used a really good mangrove hardwood or something like that, but when he came back 10 or 15 years later, the coral was alive and had grown around the wooden stakes. So Darwin was aware that if you physically fixed the coral so it didn't roll around, it would continue to grow, and that way you could generate biological habitat, not just physical habitat. And that's the basis of all modern artificial reefs or reef restoration projects, what I call Darwinian reef restoration because Charles Darwin knew it. The only difference now is that we use epoxies and cement instead of wooden stakes. It's the only difference. And it works perfectly well as long as the water quality remains perfect. As long as it never gets too hot, too muddy, or too polluted, these methods are going to work fine. Okay, the problem is what's killing the corals almost every place is because it's too hot, too muddy, and too polluted. And so you can transplant all the corals you want onto artificial reefs in those circumstances. And they're all going to die sooner or later. They'll do okay for a while. They'll behave normally until conditions become extreme, and then wham, they all die. And that's why there's no long-term results for most coral reef restoration projects around the world. They, they published a paper immediately showing success right after they've transplanted, and there's never any follow-through. So, what we call third generation artificial reefs, or you could say post-Darwinian, is, is where we're actually enhancing the biological processes that lead to much faster settlement, growth, survival, reproduction, and resistance to environmental stress. And that, that's something that I'm going to show you here next, <clears throat> how we do that. And oddly enough, we use electricity, okay? We call it biorock technology, and it was originally invented by an architect in order to produce building materials from the sea. But he noticed this, if you put a so trolls of seawater, you put a low voltage direct current into, into the ocean, you will grow limestone on one of those electrodes. Okay, you're passing low voltage current, just a few volts, very low, perfectly safe, and you can grow limestone out of seawater. It doesn't happen naturally. Limestone does not precipitate naturally in seawater. Organisms have to spend their energy to make their shell and their skeleton. But what Wolf Hilbert said is that if a shell or a coral can make a snail can make a shell to very precise architecture out of all these dissolved minerals in seawater. Why can't we be smart enough to do the same? And he played around with electricity and discovered he could grow limestone out of seawater by making metal frames of any size or shape, applying a, 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 the right kind of voltage and current to it, and you literally grow rock on top of that steel. Okay, now, his goal was to produce building materials in the sea, to make roofs or walls and arches and then take them out and make buildings. His view was to turn the ocean into a mine because we've been using limestone as a building material since the days of the pyramids. 
And Wolf found that if he grew it slowly, he could produce material that was three times harder than concrete. And by slowly, I mean one to two centimeters a year. And if we grow it faster than that, we produce a soft material that flakes off. With that, we can actually make cements that are much harder than ordinary cement that absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. We, we hope to start doing that in Mexico if we can get funding in the next year or so. Anyway, but Wolf, Wolf's idea was to produce building materials in the sea. And he started doing this in 1976 in Texas and Louisiana. And uh, I heard about his work in the mid-'80s, and um, kind of by accident, and they asked him to come to Jamaica to work with me trying to grow corals and trying to restore coral reefs. So we worked together for about 20 years until he died, and he never had a chance to get back to his original goal as an architect who's produced building materials from the sea. And there's a very good reason. If we're growing material only one or two centimeters a year, and you want to build a wall that's that thick, you know, you're going to have to wait 10 years. And no one has the patience. They want to pour the foundations and walk into the building tomorrow. So, you know, people, so it was too long-term a strategy to be effective, so that, that never went forward. But as I said, it still has applications. But we began in the 80s growing, simply growing corals in Jamaica, and we've done more than 400 projects in more than 40 countries around the world. This is one of the first ones in Jamaica, and what I did is my reef, the reef that I grew up in, had almost entirely been killed by algae overgrowth caused by our failure to treat our sewage. So what had been beautiful reefs full of corals and fish were just masses of weeds, smothering and killing everything. There's only a few remaining corals in that habitat, and I took some of the last survivors, and I took little pieces about that big, and three months later, they were three times larger in size. And so these are some of these coral fragments. Those are the last surviving corals that I transplanted. And these are sand-producing algae. These are not the weedy algae here. This big mass here is the algae that breaks apart and makes the white sand beaches, your grains. So we're producing sand as well as corals at record rates. And this was in an environment where the entire reef was dying because of severe pollution. I mean, we were almost no corals, almost no fish left. And we were able to grow corals at record rates. We were growing these corals here in Jamaica in a polluted area nearly a centimeter a week. Yeah? I mean, so we were growing corals at, you know, three or five times the record rates or more of those species in environments where they should have been dying, okay, simply by applying a low voltage current. So we can see we built a structure here. This is made out of steel. We're applying a current. We transplant coral fragments and let them grow. Uh, this is another coral that's severely endangered throughout the Caribbean. This is one that spontaneously settled and grew in one of our projects, the Zelkorn coral, which is the critical coral because it's the one that built the beach and protected the shoreline and provided the habitat for the fish. When I was a boy, we just had miles of this all around Jamaica. Miles and miles, and there's almost none left. Uh, maybe get questions later, or do you, is that okay? <laughs> all right. Um, so, um, so we, we were able to, with this, to grow corals very This is a four-year-old reef in Indonesia. This area here, we grew in an area where there was no reef. It was barren. It was sand and dead coral rubble. And so what we do is we've transplanted small broken fragments of coral that we find buried in the sand that are dying. We get, and they proliferate like mad. We build up huge fish populations. When we began, there was no corals and no fish here, essentially. Okay. This is another four-year-old reef in Bali. At this particular village, we have more than 100 of these reefs. Each one is a different size or shape. Okay, so we just put corals on, and they grow like mad. And to show you a bit of the difference here, when we began, this is how it looked. You don't see any live corals here. It's a little fuzzy here. There's maybe one live one here. I'm not sure. It's pretty much dead. It had died because of high temperatures in 1998, killed almost all the corals. And then the economic crisis, they bombed the hell out of the reefs in Indonesia. People lost their jobs, and they just went out with bombs and you know, went out fishing and wiped out, destroyed most of the reefs. So anyway, 10 years later, this is the same spot. Okay? And what, what the electrical field has done, I mean, we have a hundred structures here, but the whole area between our structures and the shore is filled in with corals because the electrical fields actually attracted them. All marine larvae actually are electrically polarized. You see, electricity is the basis of all forms of life. And all marine larvae have a positively charged and a negatively charged, and that's how you dif differentiate. Their development is driven by internal electrical currents within the cell. That sets up electrical field around them, and they're able to use the electrical field of the earth to find the bottom to figure out where to settle. Okay? They actually use the electrical field, and so we're attracting the larvae in huge numbers. It's not only corals. 
But this area here will turn from about you know one percent coral to ninety nine percent coral in ten years or so. Here, so what we're doing is the process itself just greatly speeds up settlement growth, survival, and resistance to stress. And the reason is is that the, ele the electrical currents create the ideal biophysical conditions that all forms of life use to make their biochemical energy, which is a one tenth of a volt difference between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. And all forms of life use the same enzymes to make ATP, the common biological energy currency, out of that voltage difference. And they have to spend about half of their energy, or a third of their energy, pumping electrons and protons back and forth in order to maintain that gradient. Because if that collapses, they die. They die right away. Okay? So they have to maintain that. And we're basically providing them with electrical fields in the right range, so that it's basically free energy for them. That's the astonishing thing. So we're stimulating everything, not just corals, everything. I mean, it's quite astonishing how things settle in huge numbers around our project. Now, in the severe bleaching in, in the Maldives in 1998, we had from 1,600 to 5,000 percent higher survival of the corals we were growing than on surrounding reefs. This year in Indonesia, the reefs that we were growing that were powered with our bio-rock structure, we had almost complete survival. The coral reefs that we're not, we weren't working in had 95 to 99 percent mortality from heat stroke. This year, it took, took just a couple weeks. It was that hot. And so we were able to maintain. And I, I don't have time to show you the video, but the video is really quite staggering because we just have huge fields of coral that we're growing in areas where everything around them has died. So it's, it's the, the results are really pretty remarkable. And it's, it's essentially speeding up the natural mechanism that all forms of life use to... <laughs> to resist stress and grow faster. So the result is we can keep ecosystems alive, whole ecosystems alive where they would die, or when they would die, due to severe stress, which no other method can do. We greatly accelerate their growth. Actually, I'll show you that a little later. But we get corals and everything to grow anywhere from 2 to 15 times faster. It's not just a little bit faster. It's many times faster. Now, and because we're speeding up their growth, we can restore entire ecosystems in a very short period of time, places where there's no natural recovery. And those are, these are the kind of places where, unfortunately, I get called into. Uh, this shows coral recruitment or settlement on bio rock versus controls. So we get you know, hundreds of times higher settlement. The growth rate is anywhere from 2 to 15 times faster. This is with, with bio rock versus controls. The survival is vastly higher. We get many places we get almost complete survival where natural reefs around them die. And it's not just corals. It's oysters and everything else, too. <coughs> That's because we're just stimulating the natural production of ATP by the electrical field. So it's, it's a method I don't think can be excelled. So biologically, there are huge benefits. Um, I want to show you some of the physical benefits. Because we're growing solid limestone structures of any size or shape in the ocean, these are the only marine structures that are growing. They're getting stronger with age. Every other marine material is strongest when you build it, and then it proceeds to crack, crumble, corrode, and deteriorate from that point on. Every other marine construction period. Ours is the opposite. It gets stronger with age. And moreover, it's self-repairing. As long as you keep the power on, it will heal itself. And I'll show you that in a minute. It also generates alkalinity, so it reverses ocean acidification, but on a very small scale, because you neutralize that immediately by precipitating limestone. So you don't affect the pH of the water very much. But we can grow corals in acid water using this method. It's not a problem. And oysters in acid water as well. That's something else we do. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, well, these are examples of some of the material we produce. You see, we use steel bars. These are ordinary reinforcing bars the size of my finger. And um, these, these are from the Maldives. And this is about two years of limestone growth on top of the steel. You can see there's no rusting on the steel. The electricity prevents any rusting. It's not the limestone coating. The electricity, our steel never deteriorates in the ocean. I'll show you that in a minute. OK, so this one here is from Louisiana in 1976. It's one of Wolf's first experiments. What he did is he put down, he was trying to grow building material in the sea, and he came back three months later, and it was completely covered with adult oysters. He hadn't put those on. They spontaneously settled and grew to that size in about three months. Okay? So. Um, this shows a bio-rock structure in Bowie that was a ship broke loose from a mooring in a storm and smashed into it. And this is the reinfor reinforcing bar the size of my finger that's been in the ocean for 11 years at this point. No rust on it at all. It's just been smashed by a boat the day before. Here's our limestone rock growing on it. 
Um, that's, you know, the day after it was hit. Uh, these are blue corals going like mad all over it. And, you know, smashed off the limestone. And uh, a year later, it's going back. So it's self-repairing, this material. It really has unique properties. So with that, and, and another point is that it's surprisingly resistant to, to things like hurricanes. This is in the Turks and Caicos Islands. This is a person here for scale swimming here. And this is a reef that we built that we were saving the last snorkeling reef left in the entire country. It was the last shallow reef left in the Turks and Caicos Islands. It was being killed by a cruise ship terminal. It was every time a cruise ship came in, they sent a, a plume of sand over this reef, and the corals were all dying from sedimentation. So we transplanted thousands of corals to the, the other side of, of, of the, the cruise ship pier. And these were, most of these were put on only two to three weeks before the Turks and Caicos Islands were hit with the two worst hurricanes in their history, three days apart, just one right after the other. It destroyed or damaged 80 percent of all the buildings on the island. And these structures here, we weren't even welded. We hand-tied them. We hand-wired them together. They weren't welded. They're sitting, not attached to the bottom under their own weight. And um, this is just before the hurricane and just after the hurricane, the two hurricanes. Okay? So we had almost no damage. And the reason is the waves passed through our structure. They ripped apart solid structures. The solid structure behaves very differently. It reflects the wave. All the energy is focused at that point. So when a wave hits a seawall or a a seawall or breakwater, it first washes away all the sand in front, then it washes away the sand underneath, and then it collapses. That's inevitable. It happens that every seawall that's ever been built has collapsed or will, okay, because of the physics of reflection. What we do is we do what a coral reef does. The wave goes through the reef structure, through the holes and crevices, and dissipates energy that passes through without ever being reflected. So we don't cause any erosion. In fact, what happened in the hurricane is the sand built up underneath it. Solid objects like these concrete blocks, half of them got ripped out. They disappeared during the hurricane. They just got simply went flying, okay? But because they were solid objects. So you can see there's about half as many afterwards as there were before. But our structures behave like reefs. Reefs are, are designed, they're adapted to dissipate wave energy. That's how the kind of corals make their living. Okay, how they get their food, how they get rid of their waste. So we mimic how a reef behaves in the architecture as well as in its function. <clears throat> um, this is in the Maldives. Every island in the Maldives is disappearing from erosion. And um, most cases, they've killed their reefs and piled rock walls around their beaches so they don't disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, this island here thought this was a more tourist-friendly alternative than a rock wall. But it's just as expensive. They spend millions of dollars a year pumping sand. Into, into plastic bags, and of course, when a storm hits, you've got shredded plastic all over your beach and all the sand's gone. So that, that's inevitable from that. Um, and so this is a problem that all these places have. Trees falling to the sea, buildings collapsing. In front of this place in 1997, we built a bio-rock reef right in front of that beach that had disappeared. Then we transplanted corals onto it. In 1998, this is early 1998, and Later in 1998, 99% of the corals in the Maldives died from high temperatures, from heat, heat stroke, later in the same year. But our corals almost all survived on the structure, whereas the reefs around them almost all died. Now, within about a year or two, the beach grew back. Well, when we began, this building was collapsing into the sea. There was a mountain of sandbags in front, and the management of the hotel said there was no way that they could save it. They were going to have to tear it down and move the building inland or some, something or abandon it. There was just no way to save it. We grew that beach back in about less than two years, okay, simply by making a reef in front of it. And the next picture shows the Bio Rock Reef here. That's the dark line here, and that's the new beach. The first picture was taken here, and that's the building that was falling into the sea at the beginning. And as I say, because the reef in front here all died in 1998, you know, about 99% of the corals simply died in the space of about you know, two, three weeks. All the fish moved out of the dead reef into our reef because that's where the live corals were. And so for about 10 years after this event, this is the only resort in the Maldives that had a natural beach and that had a coral reef full of fish that you could snorkel on right in front of their beach. Everyone else had dead reefs. Okay? So anyway, that really worked. And this used about one air conditioner worth of electricity to grow back that beach. And fortunately, once they got the beach back, they shut the electricity off. And this year, their corals died because they didn't turn back on. So you know, you, you can only help people so far. <clears throat> right, this is uh, the, beach, the coral reef we grew about 15 years later. 
or so, or 13 years later, when we began, there was no sand on the bottom here. It was bare rock. So the sand was built up. The corals had grown like mad. Um, you know, so it shows you, and that's a new beach. The Asian tsunami actually passed over this island. My Moldavian colleague was washed off the island and had to swim back. Okay. Uh, but we had no damage either to our coral reef or to the beach that we grew. Here's another example in Indonesia. All the beaches in the world are pretty much disappearing from coastal erosion. So this is a serious issue. But here, as you can see, trees falling to the sea, concrete bags desperately piled up along the shore in the hope of you know, saving the buildings that are behind it. What we did there is, now this, that was at high tide. This is at low tide. We built these bio-rock reef structures in front of that beach in order to dissipate the energy offshore. And these are exposed to air at low tide, so we can't grow corals on them. But in fact, what happened is they were spontaneously settled by oysters and clams. They were completely covered with, with the natural settlement. And then the local construction workers ate all of them before they could be documented, so we have no photographs of it. <laughs> okay. well, uh, but, but within eight months, you could see the growth of the beach on Google Earth. This is a Google Earth image eight months after. These are the structures we built in the water here and here. And you can see the beach growth from satellite already. <clears throat> this is another location in Indonesia. This hotel had built a seawall. You can see that the, the seawall was actually collapsing. They built it one year before. Already all the sand in front had disappeared. There was a hole underneath the seawall like this and was ready to collapse. So we, what we did here is we then built some bio rock reefs structures in front there just to slow down the wave energy before it reaches the shore. And um, one year later, Whoops. One year later, the sand had recovered in front. When we began, the, the sand level was about two feet lower than this, and there was a hole underneath the wall. So we built up the sand within a year, right at that spot. If you turn around and look behind you, that's our neighbor's property. And if you go behind the fallen tree, that's, that neighbor built the seawall one year before at the same time as the other seawall was built. It's already collapsed. So this is pretty typical. So, this is another example from Indonesia here. This is a, a beach in front of a resort that's totally disappeared. They're about to have to move the foundation of these buildings because you can see they're about to fall. There's a cliff in the sand about this high. The whole beach is washed away. Um, trees are falling into the sea. Here's a building that's about to collapse. Um, trees falling to the sea. What we did at this location is that in January of this year, we built a whole bunch of small bio rock reefs, about 50 of them. This is the beach that had the erosion problem. There's another erosion problem here where they built a seawall that was undermined and about to collapse. We built these in January of this year. By April of this year, this beach was about 80% grown back in the space of literally a couple months. And now what's happened is the amount of sand we've piled up here, there's a very strong current in this direction. That sand is now piled up here. It's built up this whole area here of erosion. We're producing so much sand and protecting it. So, and that, that's, that's something that was done this year. I mean, in, in less than a year, we grew back the beach naturally. And that's, this was taken in August, for instance. This is that same building that was collapsing in January into the sea. That's the same tree that was, was exposed and had fallen to the sea. Same location. Now it's up higher. But anyway, it, it just shows you what, what we can do. And this is looking seaward here. And this is, you know, these are underwater at high tide and uh, park exposed at low tide. We can, we can work up to the high tide mark. It's, you know, we prefer to not have to see the structures, especially since I want to grow corals. But when you get a storm at high tide, you need beach protection that you can see. So here, kind of, you have an invisible watchman there. Um, this is one of our structures, for instance. It's just steel mesh that we've used here. And um, we can see corals are springing up all around the base. I mean, this is, we put these in in January. We've got corals this big growing all over the bases of these things now. But at, at low tide, the water level's about here, so the, the lower part is always in the water. We've got a lot of fish. In fact, the, the rocks that were in here are all covered with barnacles, completely covered with barnacles in a few months. So there's a lot of life, clams and other things moving in, sea urchins, fish, and so forth. And then um, seagrass bed is growing like mad all around it. Now, what we do applies to plants as well as to animals. We greatly increase the growth of seagrass and salt marsh, oysters, fish, everything. Well, fish we don't have measurements on. And I've got to take that back. So here, here's the seagrass proliferating like mad under one of these structures. This is an example from the Mediterranean. Here, what, what I did is 
we were growing seagrass on bare rock. Okay, seagrass doesn't grow on bare rock. It doesn't grow on bare rock. It needs to have sand or mud for the roots to grow in. But here, literally, we did it on bare rock. We had two of them. We just put a little, little wire mesh down on the bottom, powered by a solar panel. And the roots grew like mad and attached to the rocks. And you can see there are clams and mussels and worms and crabs and fish all around that. We made, made a seagrass habitat in short order in a place where, where it couldn't grow. <clears throat> this is a salt marsh in New York City. This is a super fun waste site. This is one of the most polluted areas in the United States. It's an old naval shipyard where they left all the pollutants behind afterwards, and um, pretty much everything had died. Here we're growing salt marsh, the salt marsh grass that's common here in New England. Every salt marsh is eroding and weighing and disappearing. When you drive, go by train through the salt marshes or you know, look at them, Every creek has the banks collapsing and falling in. They've got cliffs there, just all disappearing because of sea level rise. So here what we did is we're growing salt marsh grass here where it couldn't recover naturally, powered by solar panels. Got some solar panels up here. And here we're growing oysters. Okay, I'll show you some of the results. Of that. This is a, I said, a severely polluted site where things couldn't grow. What we found was with the electricity, and we've, we've got a, a mesh down on the bottom here, is we're getting the salt marsh should grow about twice as fast with electrical fields and without. We're speeding up the growth. Then that's, that's the height. But there are also many more stems per clump. They're also darker green. They also seem to photosynthesize more. And down over here, we're growing salt marsh down below the lowest limit at which salt marsh can grow. There's a lower limit that's set by the wave energy that washes things out. If they're you know, underwater too much, they don't get a chance to grow very well. And so we're actually growing salt marsh below the lower limit. We've been doing that for about seven years. And every year, it springs back forth, and we get more and more salt marsh grass. Every year, the controls die. They simply can't survive through the winter with that kind of inundation. So we're actually able to spread salt marshes seaward in places where they're all eroding. I mean, we could do this easy. A place like Louisiana that's losing salt marsh, you know, two, three hundred meters a year, we could easily be growing back their salt marsh if they would let us, but they won't. Um, okay, at this particular site here, we're also growing oysters, and this shows the oyster growth without electricity, with low electricity, with high electricity, and this is the growth of a one growing season just showing the length. Of course, they're getting not only longer, they're getting wider and fatter as well, so the volume increase is very much higher, but you can see the huge difference. This is a very marginal habitat for oysters to grow at all, but with the electricity, we're able to get them a lot faster, and then over the winter, um, what is interesting is the oysters go dormant in winter. They stop growing. The controls with no electricity all shrank in size. And the reason is the water was so cold it became acidic. More CO2 dissolves in cold water. And so the 93% of the controls died in the winter and the survivors shrank in size. They were actually small. They began at 32 millimeters in length and they ended up down here at about 27. Okay? And the shells were chalky and dissolving. You can see that. The ones we had electricity with grew over the winter when they should have been dormant, and the shells were shiny and bright. So, I mean, this shows since we could restore oysters in the Pacific Northwest or places where acidification is affecting them quite easily. Um, and uh, the controls, 93% died. These ones, 100% survived. Huge difference. So, um, OK, I'm going to show you now. A lot of what we try to do is related to fisheries habitat restoration. This is in Vanuatu this year. This is the only funding we've ever had in, in 30 years of work from any government or international agency. UNDP gave me some money to do a fisheries habitat restoration workshop in Vanuatu. It's the only funding we've ever had for 30 years from any government or international agency. And so what we did is this village here is a village of subsistence fishermen who live off the reefs in their the fish from their reef. They lost their coral reef in 1943. The U.S. Navy moved in. They dredged up their reef and turned it into an airport, and then six months later moved on. So they haven't had a reef since 1943 in this fishing village, and we're trying to grow back their, their reef. And, uh, you know, the whole community is involved. The kids are really into it, and uh, they enjoy growing corals, trying to bring back the fish. We're trying to set up giant clam nurseries and other things. Giant clams grow faster and these things too. Okay, so it is really possible to restore habitat function. What we're doing is all we're doing is by putting the electric fields, everything is growing faster. We're not even really selecting it. 
Okay, now, of course, if you do that in your garden, if you spread fertilizer on an empty field, you're going to get weeds and not roses or tomatoes. So the more we manage it, the more we treat it as a horticultural project, the more we can determine what we get. Every fish or oyster or octopus is looking for a hiding place of a different size or shape. If we build lobster-shaped habitat, I'll get 20 of them in a space like this. Okay? And they know what they're looking for. Their, their populations are limited by hiding places. So the size and the shapes of the structures make a big difference. We're just beginning to learn what the different species want. But the point is, we can build structures that specifically enhance certain species so we can develop a form of sustainable mariculture that is basically based on growing the entire ecosystem back. We're not adding any food. We're stimulating the growth of everything. It's generating its own food. Okay, now, this is a very different paradigm than conventional mariculture that we're used to. Most mariculture, they're growing a single clone of a single species. Okay? It means there's no genetic diversity. When those salmon or whatever they are escape, they cause genetic pollution of the local population. Because they're concentrated, they build up parasites and diseases in epidemic proportions, which then they pass on to wild fish that happen to swim by. So they're, they're, they're focuses of diseases and parasites. They produce food that is so expensive that local people can't afford it, but at the same time, they're producing huge amounts of pollution from the rotting fish food that's put in and the rotting excrements, that the eutrophication caused by those nutrients killing the surrounding ecosystems. So they're literally destroying the fisheries for surrounding sustainable fishermen in order to produce a food that no locals could afford to buy that's being shipped off for export. So that, that's how most maricultures traditionally work. We're, we're really looking for a very different paradigm, for whole communities restoring their habitat in order to grow everything that they can, that they, they can figure out how to grow. That's really what we want to do. So we want to get this technology in the hands of the fishermen. The limit of our, th our pro process is that we have to provide electricity. We can provide any form of, we're doing very low voltage trickle charges. It's not hard to do from anything, but it's easiest, obviously, if you have a hotel at the beach and they've got electricity on the, on the shore so we can just run cables out. If we have to go to sustainable energy, that's what we prefer because fossil fuels are the number one killer of corals. We want to go to sustainable energy, but in many cases, it's a very site-specific cost decision. If they have electricity at the site, it's going to be cheaper for them to use conventional electricity, unfortunately. Okay, but wherever we can, we use solar. This is in Jamaica, you know, 25 years ago, building solar panels out in the sea. We're doing... Um, we work with tidal energy generation, too. These are the locations that have the world's highest tidal energy. These are current flows. You have to be in about a two to three meter per second range to be optimal for tidal energy generation. The power output goes up eight times for each doubling of the velocity. So at low speed, you just don't get much power. The things won't spin. And then they start to spin, and they produce more and more power. But quickly, you get to the point where it's spinning so quickly, you can't control it without it ripping itself apart. Okay, so you need to be right in the intervening, the right spot. Um, there are enormous tidal energy resources. We're not using this at all. But Indonesia is a, is a Saudi Arabia of tidal energy. If they were to use that, they could provide all their energy needs very easily. They're not tapping it at all. Certain place, but it's, it's very site specific. You have to be in exactly the right place. We're right now trying to develop the world's largest tidal energy project right here in Sonora in Mexico. It's a, a channel between, it's owned by the Klumkaak Indians who lived in the desert, hid out in the desert for 300 years living off cactus to avoid enslavement. This is their lands, and they've got one of the world's great tidal energy resources, and we're hoping to work with them to develop that to produce electricity and fresh water from desalination in an area that has no water or electricity, northwestern Mexico and the southwest U.S., so we don't know if we'll get the funding for that. There, tidal energy is a, a big possibility, but it's, you have to be in exactly the right places. Panama in the Pacific has incredible tidal energy. Uh, again, untapped. I'm Panamanian on my mother's side. I do a lot of work there. It's untapped completely. On the Caribbean, we have no tidal energy at all. Yeah, none at all. So you have to be in the right place. <clears throat> Bay of Fundy is about to start a big tidal energy project right here near our backyard, by the way, right up here in Nova Scotia. So. That, and that, that's, ocean energy has been really severely, how can I say, ignored, badly ignored, because tidal energy and wave energy are probably the two biggest tidal energy resources, energy, sustainable energy resources we have. Here's a wave energy resource, for instance. And now, remember, the winds blow most around Antarctica, so that's where the big waves are. 
Okay? Most other places, much less. But if you look at the energy here, even up here, the wave energy, you're talking about something in the range of 10 or 20 kilowatts per meter. If you were to tap the energy of the waves coming in, 10 or 20 kilowatts per meter of length of shoreline. There's a lot of energy in the waves. The problem is that people trying to develop them have tried to build huge structures for huge waves. And of course, those will never be cheap. They'll never be simple. And they'll be destroyed by a big wave before they produce any energy. What we need are small scale, cheap devices. This is a small wave energy device we're using in Bali. It's about, oh, well, let me see. Sorry, I'll, I'll show you how it works. Um, Okay, here's a model wave energy generator. <laughs> this is the inventor's prototype. Um, and the way this works is you've got a, a buoy, okay, this is, and it's moored to the bottom with a rope, okay, and floats on the top, and every time there's a wave, whoops, well, I need someone here, Adam. Okay, and so uh, Adam, Adam will be that, and I'll be the wave, and um, you know. Okay, now this thing will work in five or ten centimeter waves. Okay, and with, with the, the power you get out, you've got a permanent magnet generator built into the hinge, so every time it moves, it makes a little burst of power. And um, the amount of power you get depends on the generator. That determines the cost. So you can make a 10 kilowatt generator in something that's two square meters in size, so up this area, and make about 10 kilowatts of energy under and, and a lot of wave conditions. And with 10 kilowatts of energy, we could actually grow maybe five kilometers of reef with that. So I think just one of these, you know, would be easy to do. So wave energy for me is a wave of the future. The thing is, all the, every coastline, if you can make energy in waves this big, you can basically make energy in almost any coastline almost all the time. Of course, the power output depends on the, the velocity, I mean the height of the wave, so this is a two kilometer generator like that and designed to max out at about one, one meter wave height. That's just to prevent physical damage to it, but you can make them bigger and more robust and tap, tap the bigger waves as well, but there are a lot of possibilities, but something like this can be done almost everywhere. And the point is, is that we need to protect ourselves from sea level rise, which is happening every place and which no one is doing anything at all about except building concrete walls that fall down. And sea level rise is a global phenomenon, but it's not uniform globally, just like global temperature rise is not uniform. There's some places where it's rising much faster than others, and in fact, actually, the east coast of the U.S. is one of those as well above average and areas of the the atoll countries of the Pacific. Now, I've lived in every one of the atoll countries, and they're, they're in deep trouble. And using our technology, they, they could be going back their islands and their reefs and their fisheries and saving their islands from erosion using their own untapped wave and tidal energy resources. They're not using those at all. So this is really a pretty revolutionary technology. It's, it's uh, you know, I call it life-giving technology. We, get all sorts of biological benefits so it can be applied on whole ecosystem scale. Since we work with no funding, of course, we're building little small pilot projects that are, are a joke. But the point is, is they can be built on any size or scale, and we can actually use these to restore eroded beaches, reefs, oyster reefs, coral reefs, sea grasses, salt marshes, and mangroves, too, because we're proliferating the root growth. I mean, almost all efforts to transplant mangroves, sea grasses, and salt marshes People stick the things in the ground, and the waves wash them away before the roots grow. That happens. I mean, most of them have been failures. With this method, we think we can solve that problem considerably. So there's a lot of options now. And uh, I will say it's only a short-term and medium-term solution. We've got to clean up the pollution of our coastal waters, the nutrients that are smothering and destroying our ecosystems as well. That's a whole different issue. To my knowledge, that's only been done long-term in one place in Jamaica, a bay that I got cleaned up by cutting all the nutrient supply off. And when we did that, the algae starved and died and disappeared in weeks when we cut the nutrient supply off. It's the only place in the world that's ever been done. And if it can be done, you've just got to be complete to do it. So that, that's not very easy. So we, we need to be doing that on a large scale. But in the, the point is, what we do is going to work 
as long as global warming doesn't get out of control, because there is definitely a limit to what we can do, too. We can't save all the species all the time everywhere. There's no, not close to it. So what we have is an interim adaptive measure for restoring ecosystem function where we need it and are willing to invest the effort to protect our coastlines and beaches and hotels and fisheries and biodiversity and all that, which no government is willing to do yet. But in the long run, we've got to reverse global warming. And that, that solution, as I said yesterday, lies in land. And right now, governments of the world are meeting in Marrakesh. Uh, in France last year, the French government on December 1st in Paris proposed that soil be included in the Global Climate Change Treaty and that countries increase their soil carbon by 0.4% a year. And that was designed to halt the increase of global CO2, not, not to remove it down to safe levels. So it needs to be more ambitious. The French proposed that as a worldwide initiative on December 1st last year. On December 12th, they withdrew the proposal because it was clear that the US, Russia, and the OPEC countries would not allow, not agree to any treaty that included any form of carbon accounting. So what the French did is they made it a voluntary proposal. It's not mentioned in the treaty at all. So if you want to do the right thing privately, you can, but you're on your own. It's not policy, okay? They've gotten the French-speaking countries to go along with them. They've gotten a lot of the EU to go along with them because they say, well, this is a good thing. Why? We, we need to have more carbon in the soil because we're going to have more water, we're going to have more, more food, we're going to have more forests. There's all sorts of reasons why we need to do that. So many countries have adopted that. China is beginning to develop soil carbon policies in a very serious way. The International Biochar Initiative Board meeting in, 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 uh, in Nanjing a couple of weeks ago, the Chinese government set up a huge biochar research facility at Nanjing University. They're committed to saying, you know, millions of dollars for this facility. So I think we're getting to the point. Now, here's the other thing. I'm, I'm, I was just back from a meeting in London a couple of weeks ago, the Commonwealth Secretariat. That's 52 countries, 2.5 billion people, a third of the world's population. It's all the English-speaking countries of the world except the United States. Yeah. And what the Commonwealth governments are committing themselves to now is regenerative development to reverse climate change. So that's a third of the world. And with, with the, the, the French initiative and the French countries in the EU and China, we're getting to a point now where the majority of the world, governments of the majority of the world's population are now behind trying to solve the problem through regener restoration regenerative development. That's a completely new phenomenon. And it's now become a political hot issue with the Commonwealth countries. So it's something we need to push very aggressively. I mean, eventually the US and Russia and the OPEC countries are going to have to join the rest of the world. It's not going to happen in the next four years, I'm afraid. But um, I think this, this thing about the Commonwealth countries being behind regenerative development is really crucial. So only regeneration of natural ecosystem services can stabilize CO2 at safe levels, and we could do it in decades, as, as Jim was pointing out, I mean, if we use the best methods we know for adding carbon to soils, we can do it. And especially if we do salt marshes, seagrasses, and mangroves, because they have more carbon in their soil than there's in the atmosphere. They occupy 1% of the Earth's surface. They're not competing with, with production for food or agriculture. So if we focus in on restoring those habitats, we'll get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of storing carbon, protecting coastlines, and restoring fisheries. Right, the methods are there. The problem is we just don't have the political will to use what we know. Thanks.